tonight from wherever you're watching from you are welcome to this space right now we just want to sing some powerful amazing songs yeah. to the one and only everlasting god yeah. the never sleeping god the ever watching god yeah. so get some space wherever you are whether it is in your living room your kitchen because we're about to just praise the living god hallelujah amen well look you take us away awesome awesome let's join in let's praise the lord together come on everybody all right put your hands together come on we wait on you, Jesus. Hey! Ah. He's our Father. Say, Father, 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 we praise you, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit, yes, we adore you.
satisfaction in you just like the deer pants for water Lord we thirst for you and Lord I pray oh God that this shall be the prayer and the desire of our hearts even as we continue on through this month that we shall need you more and more and more that you shall give us extended times of worship extended times of prayer that Lord this shall not just be a moment but this shall be our lifestyle because you are here and we know for as long as you're here we have all that we need so we move and be magnified in the name of Jesus. We love you, Lord. We 
finding sources of hope, sources of trust, and we failed miserably. But we need you now, right here, right now. We will love you and we give you all the praise. Be with us even as we continue with this service and be magnified in the highest. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Mavuno Church. Uh, my name is Pastor James Mushai. I'm one of the pastors at Mavuno Church. And I'm so glad, we are so glad that you're worshiping with us today and that you're able to join us uh, uh, as, we, as we continue uh, in our worship through the month of August 2022 and as we get into this sermon series that we started last Sunday. Uh, we started a new sermon series that we're calling Relentless Pursuit, Relentless Pursuit. And we're talking about prayer. And, you know, at, it, at its most basic, Prayer is a conversation with God. We recognize that God allows us this incredible privilege of entering into his presence and of having conversations with him. And we're looking this month, we're exploring at the reasons why we pray. What is our pursuit? What is the thing that we are seeking as we come into the place of prayer? And we're looking at five pursuits of prayer. And last week, we looked at the first two pursuits. We said that prayer in pursuit of ritual is when we pray just simply to check a box. Simply, you know, it's when we pray because prayer is what we do. Uh, it's just a thing that we have been conditioned uh, to sort of get into. We said that that was prayer in pursuit of ritual. But we we, we learned that we are called to a second, the second pursuit of prayer, not just in pursuit of ritual, but prayer as a rhythm, as a, as a life, uh, you know, as part of our normal and critical rhythms of life, that prayer needs to be at the center. It needs to be established as a rhythm that we engage in regularly and consistently. There are two reasons why we need to make prayer a critical rhythm in our lives, and we learned this from a story in the Bible and from the life of Jesus. And the first lesson we learned is that Jesus did it and so should I. We saw that Jesus set the example that he had prayer firmly established as a rhythm in his life and that that's what we are also invested to. If you missed that sermon, you know, you can check it, you can find it uh, online. Uh, the second reason why we need to establish a rhythm of prayer is that rhythms establish habits that become foundations. Rhythms establish habits that become foundations. And the lesson there uh, was that, you know, when we have a rhythm of prayer firmly established in our lives, even when major events come our way that shake us in one way or the other, we remain grounded in our relationship with God and we remain grounded uh, and connected to God in the place of prayer. Today we'll be looking at the third pursuit of prayer, and this is prayer in pursuit of results. And this is when we pray. It is when we come before the Lord. It is when we engage in a conversation with God because there's a specific thing that we need. There is a specific outcome that we desire and we recognize that that outcome is beyond us. The reality, guys, is that many, for many people, their prayer life is anchored and is built around this pursuit, prayer in pursuit of results, that when they come before the Lord in prayer, you know, there are specific needs that they need to be met and that that's why they are coming before the Lord. You know, the story is told of a little girl whose mother found a note that she had written to God. It was, you know, maybe a prayer journal and she had written this note talking to the Lord and she said to the Lord, Lord, thank you so much for the little brother, but what I prayed for was a puppy. 
This girl recognized that when you come before the Lord in prayer, it is possible, or God has the capacity to intervene and to respond to the need that you present before him. You know, the story is told of a young couple who had been trusting God for children for some time, and they hadn't, uh, they hadn't gotten any. And one day their priest visited them, and he asked them, how can I pray for you? How can I pray with you? And the priest told them, and, and you know, they, they, they told the priest that they were trusting God for children. And he says to them, you know what? I've just been redeployed to Rome. I'll be working from Rome for the next 10 years and what I'm gonna do is even as I pray for you now when I get to Rome I'll go into the cathedral and I'll light a candle I'll light a candle that will mark my prayers as I stand with you and trust God for children at the end of his 10 year assignment you know he got back to the same city where he had he had traveled from and he visited the home and when he knocked on the door and the door was open there the woman stood holding a young baby with five other kids sort of milling around her and and it was clear to him that God God had answered their prayers and he said, hey, God is good. He answered our prayers. And the woman totally agreed with him. And when he asked where her husband was, he said, she said, actually, he's just left for a trip to Rome because he realized that he needs to go and put out the candle that you lit because it's a little too effective. Nearly every person understands that there is the possibility of divine intervention. Most people recognize that in a point of desperation, at a moment of dire need, you can call upon God with a desire or with the pursuit there being that he will intervene in your current crisis. We recognize that the possibility of divine intervention exists when things are out of reach for us, that God can enter into our spaces, God can enter into our circumstances and bring a result that we need. You know, as we talk about prayer in pursuit of results, I want to start by highlighting, you know, uh, four, four realities of prayer in pursuit of results. The first reality is this, we run the risk of turning God into a genie. We run the risk of turning God into a genie that all you do is rub the bottle and voila, you know, miracles come your way. The second reality is that we will often find ourselves making deals with God that I promise I will always tithe only if you give me this job. I promise I will always tithe, Lord. Yeah, uh, you know, youth pastors around the world have had this prayer. Dear Lord, if you help me and I'm not pregnant, I promise I will not be intimate again until the day I get married. You know, a serious, uh, the, uh, the first two are that, we you know, we run the risk of turning God into a genie. The second one is that we find ourselves making deals with God. The third reality is that a serious challenge with prayer at this level is that it creates an appearance of a prayerful life. But sometimes the reality is, not, is that we're not prayerful. Uh, our lives, rather, much as they look prayerful, they are totally unyielded to God. They are totally unyielded to God, and my devotion to God is only to the extent that he is able to give me the result that I'm seeking from him. The fourth reality of prayer in pursuit of results is this, that prayer yields results. That's a fact, that it is inviting God in his infinite power to enter a situation that is beyond me and to intervene in that situation. Prayer is calling in the big guns. That's what I like to call it. It's that moment in a military show when the, when the good guys are about to get overrun, the enemy forces are too significant. And just as they're about to lose, the drones come in and the helicopters and, 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 and the fighter jets and they completely annihilate the enemy. And the result becomes the opposite of what it had appeared to be just moments before. That's what prayer is. Prayer does yield results. It's inviting an infinite God into our limited circumstances with our limited power and asking him to intervene on our behalf. We're going to get into our reading and we'll be reading this from the same portion of scripture that we read last week from the book of Luke chapter 22. And the story takes place on the night that Jesus was arrested before his crucifixion. Luke 22 verse, uh, verse 39 to 46, here's what it says. Then, accompanied by the disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went as usual to the Mount of Olives. There he told them, pray that you will not give in to temptation. He walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. 
Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. Verse 44, he prayed more fervently and he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. Verse 45, at last he stood up again and returned to the disciples only to find them asleep, exhausted from grief. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you desperately, desperately needed a miracle. I know I have, and my suspicion is that many of you have been. You found yourself in a place where you desperately needed a divine intervention. Some of us know the feeling of desperately kneeling by our bed, praying for a child, a son, or a daughter who has lost their way. Some of us have experienced the desperation of trusting God to, tr to rescue your marriage, to, to bring redemption to a marriage that was on the rocks and seemed sure to fall apart. Some of us have experienced the desperation of, 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 of entering or starting a day when auctioneers were meant to come to your house or to your place of business and to take away everything that you own. Many of us have experienced desperation at one point or the other. Some of us have experienced the desperation of sitting beside a hospital bed, trusting God, asking God to heal our loved one as they lay on the hospital bed. And yet we knew that the doctor's report had, had made it clear that it was a lost cause, but we still believed and hoped that God was able to perform a miracle and to bring healing where medicine could not. Have you ever been in a desperate situation. Many of us have. Many times I have found myself in desperate situation. It's possible that even as you're watching this, this is exactly where you are in this moment, that you're in a very, very desperate situation. And I thank God that you have joined us and that you're watching this message. You know, on this night when Jesus was to be arrested, that was exactly where he found himself. He found himself in that place of deep, deep desperation. He knew what lay ahead of him. He knew that ahead of him lay a crown of thorns. He knew that ahead of him lay a beating that would leave him within an inch of losing his life. He knew that everyone he loved and cared for, including his mother and his brothers, would watch him hanging naked on a cross between two, two thieves, that they would see a soldier pierce and force a spear through his side. Jesus knew what lay ahead of him, and in this night he came before the Lord in a moment of desperation. Because he knew what lay ahead of him, he did what he usually did. He did what was in his habit. We talked about this last week. He went up to the Mount of Olives to pray, and in this instance, he was desperate for a specific result. I wanna draw out some lessons that I see and that I believe are lessons we need to learn for our own prayer lives. The first thing I see is this. I see that Jesus prayed for results. I see that Jesus prayed for results. Listen to Luke chapter 22, verse 42. Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Please spare me this agony, this pain, and this shame. That was Jesus' prayer. He had a specific result that he desired, and he sought it from his Father. I see that Jesus prayed for results. The second thing I see is that Jesus was desperate. You know, this story is recorded in the book of Mark as well. In a little more detail, in Mark chapter 14, you can read it. Here's what it says. It says it makes clear that, number one, Jesus spent three hours praying. The second thing that he was praying, lying prostrate on the ground, the word of God says he fell and with his face to the ground, he called upon the Lord and raised this prayer. And it also makes it clear that he was praying the same prayer, that for those three hours, the, all he was doing was seeking the specific result that he was desperate for in that moment. And in case you missed it in Luke 22, listen to verse 44. He prayed more fervently and he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. That's how desperate Jesus was for the result he was praying for. 
The first thing I see is that Jesus prayed for results. The second thing I see is that Jesus was desperate. The third thing I see is that God sent an angel. The Bible makes that clear, that, that God sent an angel to strengthen him in this most desperate time of need. Those are the first three lessons that I see in this portion of scripture. He prayed for results, he was desperate for the result, and God sent him, sent him help. And this is my final observation. I see that Jesus did not get the result. The result that he was praying for desperately, the result that he needed desperately. I see that God, the Father, had made a declaration over Jesus. He had declared at the beginning of his ministry that he loved him, that he was pleased with him, and he approved of him. And yet I see that as Jesus came before the Father in prayer saying, take this cup away from me, I see that the Father's answer was no. Because Jesus was arrested, Jesus was tortured, Jesus did suffer the shame of a painful death on the cross. Those are the highlights that jump out at me. That Jesus prayed for results, that Jesus was desperate, that God sent an angel, and that Jesus didn't get the results. What does this mean for you and for me? What does this translate into, into our prayer lives? And I'm going to share with us a couple of three lessons that I believe are what God would have us take out today as we are talking about this pursuit of prayer, prayer in pursuit of results. The first thing is this, I see that Jesus did it and so should I, that the example that our Lord Jesus set for us when it comes for prayer is that he sought a result from the Lord. And I believe that God's desire is that you will come to him in your point of need and you will exercise your faith and you will trust him to come through for you. At your, most, uh, at your deepest point of need, that you will trust God to deliver specific results that cannot be attained in your power or, 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 or through natural means, that you will seek supernatural intervention. I see when it comes to prayer in pursuit of results that Jesus did it, and so should I. The second thing I learn and, and that I believe God is inviting us into is that we need to pray relentlessly. That's the second lesson I see. I see that Jesus prayed relentlessly. You know, I've learned that sometimes as a Christian, I want to say my prayer, I want to say a brief prayer, and then I want to trust God for an immediate result. But the lesson I find in the scriptures with Jesus in this story, but with many other characters in the Bible, is that many times the invitation we have is, is, is an invitation to seek God relentlessly, consistently, passionately, as we trust him for the results that we desire. I see that God just doesn't call us to just a life of prayer, but a life of relentless prayer. That's what Jesus did. He didn't just pray passionately. He prayed passionately for an hour and then prayed passionately for a second hour and then prayed passionately for a third hour, asking for a result that he was desperate for. Is your life marked by relentless prayer? I believe that God is inviting us to a life marked and distinguished by relentless prayer. That even when I have been praying for a year or five, even when I have been praying for a decade or two, that I will continue to call upon his name and I will continue to trust that he will intervene in my situation. I see that God invites us to a life of relentless prayer. The third lesson that I see for us as we go through this story is that my relationship with God should not be founded on whether or not he answered my prayer. My relationship with God should not be founded on whether or not he answered my prayer. Here's a question for you. What is, the relation, what is the state of your relationship with God when he doesn't answer your prayer? What, what's the outcome of God saying no to you or of you having to wait for a long time for a prayer that you desire and perhaps even desperately need? I learned from this story that the nature and the quality of my relationship with God must not be defined by whether or not God answered my prayer. The nature and quality of my relationship with God must not be defined by whether or not, or must not be defined exclusively by whether or not God answered my prayer. Jesus lay prostrate before his father. He knew fully that God was able to deliver the result. He knew that nothing was impossible with him, that with a snap of his fingers, the madness could stop. All his father needed to do was say yes to his desperate prayer. But his father said no. 
Please remove this cup of suffering from me, he said. But the father said no. You see, if Jesus' relationship had been based exclusively on whether or not God answered his prayers in this particular instance, or rather this particular instance would have been the end of Jesus' relationship with his father. But what a powerful lesson we learn from his attitude, from his perspective, from his response to how God, uh, you know, to this situation and the fact that God was inviting him into a place of difficulty and suffering. I believe that God is asking us to be people whose prayer is marked by the words of Jesus, not my will, but yours be done. I believe that God is saying that even as you pray and trust me for results, even as you pray relentlessly and trust me for results, that your prayer must still be marked by the attitude that marked Jesus' prayer, that not my will, Lord, but your will be done. Some of us will have heard this statement, maybe from a loved one, from a friend, from a relative. God and I are not talking right now. We are not on good terms. Some of us know of people or have heard from people who have left the faith because God didn't answer a prayer that they were raising. And God didn't come through for them and God let them down. Some of us have lived with a feeling of deep disappointment after God did not respond to a desperate, desperate ask that we made of him, that God allowed the loved one we were praying for to pass on, that he allowed us to be auctioned, that we lost our home or our business or our property, that an unfair termination from our workplace wasn't stopped, and as a result, we have struggled significantly in our finances, that the marriage we had prayed for, even for decades, still fell apart. It's possible that you've been living with a deep with a sense and a feeling of deep disappointment in God. Many of us have experienced that, but God is inviting us to this kind of relationship with him, a relationship that is not defined exclusively by whether or not he answered our prayers. He's inviting us to the relationship modeled by Jesus, who prayed desperately, remove this cup of suffering away from me, but not my will, but yours be done. This is the kind of prayer that God is inviting us into. This is the nature of the relationship that he's inviting us into. So the three key lessons that I have for you from this story as we talk about prayer in pursuit of results are these, that Jesus did it and so should I. Jesus prayed for results and so should I and so should you. I see that God invites us into a life of relentless prayer, a relentlessness in our pursuit of him. This sermon series is called Relentless Pursuit. That's the thing that God is inviting us into. And I see that God invites us to pray, not my will, but yours be done. I want to close with a story. The story is told of 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 a man who loved God and served him passionately while he was alive. And the man went to heaven and God showed him the journey of his life and he saw that his life was represented by a walk on the beach. And he could see all the different seasons and all the different experiences that he had gone through. And he noticed something interesting. He noticed that the seasons that had been extremely difficult, uh, you know, those seasons when, when he saw the footprints on the sand in the beach, he realized that in the difficult seasons he only saw one set of footprints in the sand. And he finally understood it and he said to God, I see, I I see that what I thought was right in my hardest moment, in my darkest days, in my most difficult seasons, I thought you were not with me. I couldn't feel you. I didn't see you in my life. And I see that I was right. I see that that's why I felt that way. I see that in those moments I was walking by myself. But God looked at him with love in his eyes and he said to him, actually, You've got it wrong. In your darkest, most difficult moments, you're right. There's only one set of footprints in those seasons, but they aren't your footprints. They are mine. Those are my footprints that you see in the sand because in your darkest, most difficult moments, I carried you. You didn't even have to walk. That story kind of talks about what happened to Jesus that on this night when he desperately, desperately needed an intervention from his heavenly father, God did intervene. God did intervene. He sends an angel to strengthen him in that moment of pain and in that moment 
of difficulty and of despair. The intervention came from God. It just wasn't the intervention that Jesus had asked for. He sent an angel. God sent an angel to strengthen him. He made sure that he had the grace to seek him in prayer on that night. And he made sure that he had the grace to go through the suffering and the pain that he had to go through and to endure. But God was with him all the time. He was hearing him. His love was sure and it was firm. He was sending the resources that he needed. He was hearing his prayer and responding to them, even if the answers to the prayers were not what Jesus specifically had asked for. The same is true for you, that as you watch this, God is with you, that as you watch this, God desires to walk with you, that even if he hasn't answered the prayer, even if in your desperate moment you didn't get the result that you desired, that God was still with you, he was still walking with you, he was still invested in you, he was still loving you, he was still being faithful, even if the answer you prayed for didn't come through. And that many times, maybe you didn't see the angel, maybe you didn't see the help that he sent, maybe you didn't see the investment that he made, but he's there all the time, always with you, strengthening you and carrying you through your most difficult moment. I want to pray for us as we bring this message to a close. And the first prayer I want to pray is for someone that as you're watching this, Maybe as an individual, maybe even as a family, you're in a difficult, difficult moment and you're going through significant pain. And my prayer is that God will strengthen you and that you will see the strength that he's sending your way. I will pray with you that God will send the intervention that you need. But I will also pray with you that if he doesn't, that you will find the grace and the strength to go through the season that he allows you to go through and that your relationship will overcome the fact that he did not answer the prayer in the way that you needed it to be answered. Our Father and our King, we thank you. We thank you that your love for us is sure and it is certain. I pray for a brother, for a sister, for a family, for a couple who are in a difficult, difficult moment right now. I pray that Holy Spirit of God, you will help them see that you're strengthening them even at this time. I pray that you will open their eyes to the very real interventions that you're already sending their way, that you will help them recognize that you're with them even in the dark, dark valley that they might be going through. I stand with them in prayer, Jehovah God. You're challenging us through this message that we must trust you for results in our times of challenge. I pray for a miracle. I pray that you will deliver the impossible. I pray that you will do that thing that will exceed their power and their capacity. Whether it is healing or miraculous provision, whether it is reconciliation and restoration of relationships, whatever it is, whether it is emotional healing and a binding up of broken hearts, I pray that would you do it right this moment, even as they are listening to this message that you will cause them to receive the result that they are trusting you for. But even if the result doesn't come through, Lord, then I pray that you will cause them to know that you're with them right there in the challenge and the difficulty and that you have made available every resource that they need for this season. The next thing I want to pray for us is that God will give us the grace, the grit, and the discipline to pray relentlessly, that our lives will be marked by relentless prayer. Our Father and our King, this is what you invite us to, a life marked by diligent, fa diligence, faithfulness, and consistency in seeking you. I pray that, Lord, you would pour out upon us as we, uh, every person listening to this message and myself as well, a spirit of prayer, a spirit of supplication and intercession that our lives will truly be marked and we will be people who seek you faithfully, diligently all the time, in the good times and in the hard times, that we will be seeking you and that we will be praying and we will be calling upon your name and that our lives will be anchored on prayer to the glory and to the honor of your name. You know, this rough night that Jesus was going through was because he was about to be crucified. And as I bring this to a close, allow me to share this with you. Maybe you're watching this and you're not born again. You're not a follower of Jesus. You're not in relationship with your heavenly father. 
you need to realize that the reason God said no to this desperate, desperate prayer that Jesus, his son, was raising was so that you could have the opportunity to live in relationship with God the Father. And I want to invite you to respond by accepting the blessing of forgiveness that God presents before you through the sacrifice of Jesus and through the pain that he went through. And if you want to say this prayer, I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to ask that you just, you know, re you repeat these words after me. As you receive Jesus into your heart, as you commit to a life of relationship with the Father and submission to his will. That's his desire for you. And that's why he was willing to let Jesus suffer on the cross. And that's why Jesus was willing to accept the will of his Father. He did it for you. And it is you that he was seeking to redeem if this is you, let me ask you to just say this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your love. I thank you because you have made your grace and your mercy available to me. And today I receive your forgiveness for all my sins. I thank you that you're calling me your child. And I commit from this moment to honor you and to live a life of, uh, of obedience and submission to your will. I thank you that I am now a child of God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Even as we bring this to a close, let me invite you to the same two things that I invited you last week, that you will make, a, you know, we have a rhythm of prayer that every Monday to Friday, we meet at 4.30 in the morning to seek God together. Would you make this a rhythm that you observe in your life? But secondly, would you raise up an altar in your family, in your household of regular prayer and of relentless prayer, even as we trust God to help us become, uh, you know, like Jesus and to follow his example. God bless you and have a wonderful week ahead.